Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so this is a follow-up to last week's review on the Tolman Icon Bomb Machine and one particular part of it. We talked about how they have a, a, a an attractor or a or a um, you know a, what's the word auto associative memory that spans multiple scales and um, and we were a little hesitant about this because of just our intuition about grid cells and what happens when you combine multiple scales and so this is a follow up on that I learned a little bit um, it's not uh, let's see our intuition was partly right but I learned something by really trying to create some figures here that demonstrate this this was partly inspired by uh, a couple of tweets from Tim Barons so this is kind of a follow up on this so I definitely learned something here and I kind of want to share it. Uh, some quick review on what we talked about last week. This is copy and pasted from my last presentation. Uh, the, the model of their hippo, of the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, uh, where the top the 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 place cells form an auto associative retractor network, storing feature location pairs, location sensory pairs. The bottom medial entorhinal cortex is of course grid cells, uh, and lateral is sensory input. Um, and and they have different temporal scales on the sensory input. So there's sort of like a smoothing input on the sensory input. And whereas as you, as you go to the right, the scales of the grids get larger. And the other review slide is they they treat place cells as these um, as these uh, products of the two cell types. Uh, one where you take a given grid cell and a given sensory cell. And there is a place cell for that pairing, and um, and there, I have one more slide reviewing this. So then a feature location pair actually you know transcends all of the modules. A feature location pair is encoded by the population of place cells across multiple modules, and so this picture down on the bottom shows basically everything: you, the lateral entorhinal cortex, the sensory input on the bottom sort of anoints a set of columns in this picture. It says you're allowed to be active. The grid cells sort of anoint a set of rows and say you're allowed to be active. And the intersection of them is what becomes active. And the only the only crosstalk between modules is at the level of these cells. They, they're, they learn these attractor states like this. So this is the review. This is me just pay, getting you to page back in what we talked about last week. Uh, now, our intuition, our background on this, why, why um, part of this, Jeff and I agreed that that like part of it felt a little wonky, and I'm trying to display that to you right here. Uh, we're we're a little bit skeptical of the multi-scale grid cell readout. Uh, here, I've shown three, I'm oh, sorry, five grid cell modules, uh, and before and after a movement. So I've used blue to denote another grid cell representation. So here, I'm depicting two grid cell representations. And I've made it kind of cartoonish, where one of them changes a lot. Most of them don't change at all. Um, and the the point, the, the intuition here is that to read out this code is hard. To, to re, a readout neuron would have to be very precise to discriminate between the black and blue representations, um, especially when you adopt the mindset that, no, that neurons are noisy and dendrites need to be fault tolerant. So dendrites need to not um, expect an exact number of matches. So, so something felt off about this with, with multiple scales. And so this intuition has kind of pushed us away from thinking grids of-, of Just, just to add a little, a little flavor yeah. to that, um, is that when we think about learning, like you're forming synapses on a dendrite, um, you, you are, you're, you're basically trying to figure out which, which of these inputs are active at the same time. And if, so, and if several of these, like the ones on the right in this picture are active at the same time, like you say, oh, this is a pattern, but if some of the others are changing rapidly, you would say, no, that's not part of this pattern. So you just wouldn't, the, a local rule, learning rule on a dendrite would, as we've always thought about it, um, that doesn't mean it's right, but as we've always thought about it, a local learning rule on a dendrite would say, hey, the thing that's changing a lot looks kind of like noise, it's not part of this pattern, therefore we wouldn't form synapses to it, but the system requires you to do so. In this case, you show three of these units being the same, but in a more general case, uh, uh, most of them would be different. And you know, only as you go to the right, there'd be more stability, but in the left, almost everything on you know, very quickly things get wonky on the left side. So it's it's more than just a, being able to decode the pattern. It's also a learning rule about how synapses are formed that would, would seemingly fail under this kind of scenario. 
Yeah, so this this was laying out the review in the background. Now, now to show where I kind of learned something by creating exact diagrams. Basically, the question I'm asking is, now that we move, um, if, now that we're moving this multi-module code up to the place cells, up to the feature location pairs, uh, does this problem carry through? Does it remain or does it does it change? Is it no longer uh, quite as bad or is it a different problem? And so, yeah, should this multi-scale readout as bad intuition carry over to this model? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to show two figures here. There, uh, there's a lot going on here, so I'll animate them in. Uh, but this scenario here is um, consider a small movement where, much like much like what I showed here, a movement where only one of these modules changes. Virtually, essentially, essentially only one of them changes. Uh, and in case one, um, in, so so it's important to distinguish between these two cases because they. Um, Keep in mind they're also modeling lateral antirhinal cortex as having different temporal scales. And so um, it kind of in their mindset, it's likely that case one is going to occur where only one module sensory input is going to change. This uh, the sensory representation. It, here I'll bring in the figure in a second. The the sensory representation though is going to say the same in most of it. So what the way I show this is the leftmost module has its location change. That's the blue moving down. Um, the leftmost module also has its sensory input change. The red, I drew it moving right. It didn't have to be a translation of the two, but that's just what I did. Uh, the rest of these remain totally the same. Um, and so just this is setting up the problem. The next, the next slide is going to talk about, is this going to work? But, but what I'm just saying here is, um, if you did know both the, sens the location and the sensory, in both of these cases, these are the two attractor states that are going to be learned. And the two attractor states are going to be overlapping. You, one of them is going to be this, this top, the, the, the top set of cells. The other is going to be the bottom set of cells, uh, which contained many of the same cells. Um, and the, the, the second case, in, in some ways, the, the second case is more how we have used grid cells in the past where all of the sensory inputs are going to change as you move. But, but the location, because we're using this multi-scale scale code, the location is not changing. There's, there's a lot more arrows here, but it's conceptually kind of simple. It's the same as what I did in, before, where the location is changing in one of them. The sensory is changing in that same one, but the sensory is also changing in all the other ones. And, so, an so in this case, the lower on. one, you're saying these are all basically modules at the same scale, but maybe different orientation or slightly different scale. Or something. No, I, I would say all. I would say their um, th their spatial scale is different. Their spatial scale is all. All of these have the same spatial scale. The only thing I'm changing here is um, lateral and entorhinal cortex, the temporal filtering. Um. Okay, you said this is the way we thought about, it, but we've never thought about models across scales like this. Um, no, I know, but we also haven't done temporal filtering and uh, across scales. Mm -hmm. um, I, if we took our if we took our model, plugged in, um, plugged in multiple scales, rather than um, using a single roughly scale, uh, roughly single scale. This is this is more like what we would. Say. Well, but I don't get it because um, why would we assume the scale change? Every one of these things is changing. I mean, if I look at grid cell modules and I look at the uh, the, the range of grid cell modules, the ones with the larger scale are huge. Uh, you remember they had to do the experiments where they put a rat in a maze that went down the long hallway <laughs> to get to get to show the effect. Okay, um, I think I, I think you're getting stuck on a statement I made, and I want I could just retract that statement. But okay. this is more like our models. Uh, that I really am just setting up two, um, the two extreme cases. The one extreme case is where um, it, I, I'm holding this constant. I'm saying only one good, only one module's grid cell is going to update. Uh, and the open question is what happens to the sensory input. And are these both cases here are one module grid cells update? That yes, that's what the blue is. That's what the blue rectangle moving to the dotted rectangle is. Okay. All right. I didn't catch it. All right. And the only thing I'm changing between these two is do all the modules sensory input change 
or do they, or does only one of them change? And you're arguing that they all change? I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm setting up the two cases. I'm not choosing an opinion here. Okay, but in I'm the not, lower one, the lower case is they're all changing. Yeah. Which is a little hard to imagine if the location's not changing, how does the sensory input change? I mean, you know, it's, it's like if you think about the different uh, module, the different regions of visual cortex, you know, um, the sensory, if you look at the receptive field size of a cell in V2, it's much larger than V1 and V4 is much larger than V2 or something like that. So it's a little hard for me to imagine how the location would stay the same, but the sensory input would change. Um, I'm, I'm just having trouble imagining it. But I mean, part of this is the location is very subtly changing, but not discernibly. All right. Well, I guess I'm, I, I'll let's keep going, but I'm still okay. stuck yeah. on the point. It's, it's not super important. Basically, I'm okay. just setting up the neural mechanism, the two extreme cases. Um, okay. So, so as long as you understand that, yeah, the I, I understand are, case two. I I don't I understand case two, but I don't understand how it can happen. But I'll I'll accept it for the moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'll move on. So so now the two questions I'm going to ask are: first of all, um, can a location predict a feature? Uh, I'll, I'll get to the second question. The second question is going to be: Does readout work? Uh, but but the more fundamental question for their model is: Given a location, can you will this attractor successfully predict a feature? And um, and so you see the answers here that I that I'm stating, um, but I'll, I'll walk through them here. So I mean. You, you see that, I mean, going back and forth between these two slides, I should have animated differently. So back and forth, I've, I've just taken these same two pictures and removed a bunch from it yeah. and said that if you if you activate a given location, a given grid cell in each module, it's going to provide excitatory input to these rows of cells. Um, and so the, the question is, um, is this going to is this attractor going to successfully activate this pattern of dark red? Um, and my intuition says yes. The the fact that there is this other these other two cells that are um, kind of confused or kind of um, the, very close to this attractor point um, isn't a problem because these cells aren't receiving good cell input. And so, I think that in their model, a location is going to successfully predict a feature. Whereas in ours, when we talk about um, grid cells of multiple scales, it it doesn't really work because that requires a readout that we don't like. But here, I don't well, think there's any such problem. So this gets back to my, my concern earlier. I tried to make the definition. The real problem for me of the different scales is the learning problem. And so the uppercase here, case one, requires that I learn, I don't know if you want to call it two attractors or one attractor, but you've got, let's say two attractors or, or one attractor for union. I'm not sure how you want to phrase it, but there are two, you know, four of those modules are all stable, but the other, going down to the one on the left, you have to predict two things. So I have to say, okay, I'm going to predict either one, and, you know, either one location or another location. Um, and, and the question I have at the time is like I learned especially if, if we start thinking that it's more than one location, maybe there's you know half a dozen or a dozen that options down in the left module there. It doesn't seem you could learn these attractors. That's, that's the problem I have with it. If the attractors were learned, then yes, it would work. I could see that if those, if those swooping black arrows were all learned, then yes, it would work. Um, what do you mean? The, so they are, these swooping black arrows are learned. But I'm thinking how they learn practically on a dendrite, you know, it's like, I'm, again, I imagine, just imagine I'm a dendrite, a section of a dendrite, and I, I'm looking at all these cells and I'm trying to learn a pattern. And some of the, again, like I said earlier, some of the cells are sort of stable for a long period of time, and then I get another pattern, and then I get another pattern. Well, that's easy, I can learn those attractors. But while, one, while some of those cells are stable for a long period of time, there's other cells that are changing rapidly. And I'm not gonna learn them as part of that attractor. So, the, in, the, in the more extreme case, on the left here, I might, as I go left on this diagram, I'll have lots of changes or lots of possibilities on the left and stability on the right. And so how do I learn that attractor when there's all this instability on some of the inputs? I have to somehow say, yeah, I'm going to learn those even though they're, I just don't know how the dendrite could do that. How, how would I know to associate a changing, an axon that's going by that's changing rapidly while a bunch of axons going by that are not changing rapidly? 
how do I associate the changing one with all the ones that are that aren't changing? Why how would why wouldn't I just assume that's a, a, a noise or another pattern or something? You know, I, I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to imagine how the dendrites are actually learn that. Um, I may, I, maybe I'll get over it, but okay, I'll, I'll just, let's put that aside for now. Maybe it's just I have to rethink how I think things like that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure yet. I, I haven't internalized that yet, that, what you're yeah. saying. That, that's always been my objection. I've always imagined myself as a dendrite section, trying to look like, okay, what kind of simple heavy and rule do I want to use to learn these? There's a pattern out there. And, um, and if some of, the, some of the potential synapses are changing rapidly and some are not, how am I going to learn to associate the ones that are changing rapidly with the ones that are not changing? If I, if I just say, okay, I'm just going to group everything together, then I don't have a learning rule. Then I basically I say, anything that's changing out there, I'm going to group together. It's like, how is that? I just don't see how to do it. But let's put that aside for a moment. Now, this will just help me. So, so you're saying if I'm a dendrite on this large scale, one that's changing very slowly, uh, you know, sometimes this cell is going to be active. Sometimes this cell is going to be active, and they're kind of mutually exclusive. And so, if I'm a dendrite over here, uh, or you just pick, like, pick the second, pick the second one, the second block. Okay, it might be easier. Just the, the one that the, might be. Yes, yeah, so you could see the one on the right, but just pick the second block. The second block shows two arrows coming in from the left and one arrow from the right, meaning there's two there's two different patterns that are oscillating on the left, and there's one pattern that's coming in from the right. And this problem could be much worse than two to one. And so if you're a dendrite in that block, how do you know to associate the stable one on the right with the changing ones on the left? That's the question. I guess I'm, okay. I, I'll have to sit with this for a little while. My intuition is that if with the simple rule of it connects to the cells that it tends to fire with. Yeah, but tends to fire with means that, that they're not, that, that they tend to fire with. If, if the ones on my left in this diagram are changing rapidly, then they, I can't assume that they're if they only one out of 10 times they, they fire with the ones on the right, then I would say, nope, they're not firing together. Um, you know, uh, I just I just would think that. <laughs> it's just like they have to fire together, not like fire together every once in a while. Um, you know, maybe it could be finessed. Maybe it could be finessed. I'm, I'm not claiming that I, I just, it's the way I've been thinking about it. Maybe I can, I can, I'm imagining myself saying, well, what if I modified my heavy and learning rule and thought about it a little differently? Maybe I get it to work. So let's go with that for the moment. If, if you can form the connections you see here, I, then I can see it can make the prediction. I have no problem with that. Um, it's, okay. it's the, I, oh, go on. It's, it's the heavy and learning thing, you know? Think about the way spatial pooler learns. The spatial pooler basically says it's it's constantly it's constantly forgetting connections that don't occur reliably enough with other ones, right? So there's going to be some threshold that says, you know, you're just not firing together often enough. You're out of here. Um, so that's that's the basic of heavy learning. You have to have some level of yeah, these are firing together enough enough of the time. And as soon as they, as soon as you don't fire enough of the time, then I have to assume you're, you're just, you're not part of this group. You know, you have to, you have to, we're just going to forget you. And that's that problem exists here. Now the bottom picture here, you're saying here. Um, well, I'm not sure what the bottom picture shows. So yeah, the the bottom picture is um, in the other extreme case where all of the inputs have changed. That means the conjunctive representations have changed, the place, different place cells are active, um, then the, the two attractor states don't overlap. Uh, and so what will happen when you burst these rows, given the location input, is, well, first of all, what will definitely happen is it'll resolve down to all these dark red cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the open question is whether it's going to be powerful enough to then silence these two and these two, the wrong ones, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. is the attractor going to be good enough after a couple iterations to silence those? That's no longer a learning problem. That's an inference problem. That's a, how good is the yeah. attractor? Yeah, right. Um, but it's related. It's related in the sense that if you assume that I've learned these patterns that are just they're largely the same but small differences, um, you know, can I just can I uh, differentiate the two? Right. 
at some point, this clue is going to answer at some point where you know the, if the percentage of cells that are that are unique or is small enough that you won't be able to do it, right? I mean, it's, there's always noise in the system. There's always some stochasticness going on. Um, yeah. Okay. So I would say their their paper, their philosophy is more this top picture because they have the temporal scales going on. They have slow input to this one and yeah. fast input to this one. And so this is more their mental model. And so I think like where we stand on this at the moment is that the inference uh, part of this holds up. It, it seems to work and maybe a little skeptic, some skepticism on the learning. The dendrites, it doesn't seem like dendrites would do this. Yeah, I guess I, I, it's always been the learning issue for me. So okay. yeah. I just so, something. Yeah. So that's, I brought it up earlier when you brought it up. I said, no, it's really a learning issue. Um, so uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's a very interesting question to ask. Um, that you know, to question that assumption. I mean, I, you recall, Marcus, when we started talking about multiple grid cell modules, I immediately objected to the idea that we're mixing scale, and it was for this reason. Um, and then we found out later that oh, it doesn't seem to be much, you know, interaction between the scales, the different modules at different scales. We, that it, it didn't seem to find the connections that span different scales. So we said, okay, that's consistent with that. Um, but you know, maybe there's maybe we're wrong about that. Maybe I was wrong about that. Maybe there is a way to get it to work. Um, and I mean, in this case, you also pointed out, oh, they're not really talking grid cell to grid cell. They're talking, you know, they're, they're doing this, this sort of place cell union with the connections across. So maybe those connections do exist. So I think it's worth, I think it's worth putting this back in the potential toolbox of like, oh, maybe we got that part wrong, or I got that part wrong. And maybe, maybe there is a way of getting it to work. Um, I'm not sure yet, but um, I'm willing to give that a try. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, uh, yeah, kind of my intuition, like you say, Marcus, is that kind of with a, a basic heavy and rule, like what you see kind of in case one should be possible, but that maybe, or, or like would occur, but that maybe kind of along the lines of what you're saying, Jeff, that um, the, this could lead to issues further down the line. And I, I feel like um, kind of we, we mentioned last time about how they reset the weights, uh, the heavy and weights. Um, uh, between environments and that sort of thing, and so it'd be I, interesting I, to see the, the system if if it uh, if it's keeping uh, a lot of these weights. Uh, I, 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 have a, I have trouble if you get kind of a, almost like a catastrophic, uh, or if there's just kind of so many learned associations that it um, yeah that has difficulty. It seems to me. I mean, I don't. I actually. I mean, I'll say it again. I don't see how heavy and learning achieves the upper result here. I mean, if you do, it's going to create too, way too many synapses. And maybe that's what you're referring to. Uh, uh, it's, it's, if I accept that, okay, we're going to be doing some heavy learning here, and we're going to group things that fire together, but they don't have to fire together all the time. In fact, they don't even have to fire together very often. You know, every once in a while, they fire together. We're going to form that, that connection. Okay, well, I could have a heavy and rule like that, but then what I would end up doing is forming synapses that could ton a ton of things. I don't really want to form synapses, do they really weren't. Um, causally connected. So I, I think there's an inherent issue with yeah, heavy or, learning. Or, or that at least like, unless you have a uh, kind of unconstrained um, representational capacity, then it's, yeah. it's going to be difficult to maintain it all. Yeah, well, uh, and then, without then, it then kind you of do maintain, but then, you know, then you'd have to go through the math and see what is your chance of, of error. Um, we've done this kind of work in the past, but like, okay, what if I'm forming connections to things I shouldn't connect to? But so what's the harm in that, right? Um, what's the harm in that? Well, the harm eventually becomes at some point you recognize a pattern that really wasn't, you know, a, a real pattern at all. <laughs> you know? It's like, imagine I'm in that second box from the left. And imagine now I formed, instead of two associations on the one on the left, I formed 10 associations on the one on the left. Now, now what can happen is I can get the, what we used to call mix and match errors. I could, I could, I could be presenting some other pattern on the, um, uh, into the system and I'm picking one cell from, you know, and, and by chance there's a, there's like, um, I, I have a, by chance there's a, each of these cells is used in multiple patterns. So I have some different patterns on the left that shouldn't be part of this union, or shouldn't be part of this, uh, this stable pattern. But I just randomly pick you know, by chance. I have some from pattern A, some pattern B, and so and they they line up with the, the synapses that we had before. Again, we 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 call this mix and match errors. Or maybe that helps refer it that way. Um, 
then I start at some point, if I start forming all these extra synapses, I will start having mix and match errors and I'll get, I'll get, I'll detect patterns that I really shouldn't have detected. That there wasn't a pattern there, but just by chance there's enough uh, active uh, cells and across uh, different patterns. And so there, that's the downside. So there's, there's this tension between, you know, being too specific in your learning um, or being so unspecific, you get mixed and match errors. And um, we've, we've dealt with that problem in the past. Um, and so maybe the, maybe the math would work out here. Maybe the scale that we're talking about, the inferential cortex, for example, we wouldn't run into problems. I don't know. Um, okay. But I think there's clarity here, at least on, on the assumption. I mean, it, it, I think I'll just put one more thing. From a purely sort of, uh, if you want to think of just from a purely mathematical point of view, if you're, if you're not really thinking about sparse patterns all the time, you can easily see that you could form um, these, um, these the cross module associations um, that are, that only differ by a you know, small percentage of their cells. Um, and that's fine. You know, you can, you can just, they're technically discernible, right? You can say, well, if I have two patterns and they share 90 or 80% of the same um, cells, but still they're separate, so I can di differentiate them. But from a neuronal, neuron point of view, it gets very, very difficult to differentiate. Them. So from a pure mathematical point of view, sure, you can do that, no problem. Uh, but from a, from a neuron point of view, it's like, eh, no, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> so again, it, it's a holdover from sort of dense thinking or dense pattern principles. I don't know if that helps at all. I have one more slide. It's not super important, so I'll just go through it quickly, and then okay. uh, if we have any more. So the 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 final one is well. Let's go back to readout, like what we were talking about. I to say it's less important because their model doesn't really rely on reading out these codes at all. It really treats them as a big attractor, and that's it. They don't read them out. But uh -huh. um, it's still an interesting question, especially when we're talking about a hippocampal code. Often reading those out is vital in most people's mental model. So you say so, reading uh, out like can I identify the, the underlying object here or something like that? Is that um is that yeah or, or no no it's it's more it's more like if you want to associate a memory with a given feature location pair if you want uh, to evoke a memory because we're talking okay. about the campus here. Okay. Uh, if you want to treat this as like a you know a memory index can you read out this place code? Mm, okay. Um, and and it seems to me that uh, the top case is going to suffer from the same issues of the multi-module grid cell code, where it's hard to distinguish the top from the bottom. Um, unless you yeah, have, like, that, is that is that the, is that the issue I was just talking about? Is that the same thing I was just saying? Or I was saying like mathematically, I mean, from a purely information theory, that the information is there, but it would be hard for neurons to read that out. Is that what you're saying? Well, I guess the difference, if I understand correctly, is before you were kind of, you had some input from the environment, whereas here you're kind of going back and trying to recall uh, something. Is that is more that kind of? Oh, is that is that, that is that what is that what you're saying, Marcus? Well, in general, it's just the open point of I I can't tell if it's the same as what you were saying, but it's just the point of um, if you want to associate something with this particular pattern, uh, it's hard because it's probably also gonna be invoked by the bottom pattern. Uh, I'm just making that simple statement. Yeah, so again, there's a, a big overlap between those patterns, is that yeah. thing? Yeah, okay, yeah. so that, that's what I was saying too. I, okay. yeah, yeah. And then Niels, I'm not sure if that fits what you're saying. But, yeah, no, I think that's... Uh, but an interesting yeah. other point is this case two, which was kind of the weird one before, is now nice because now it's two <laughs> patterns are totally non-overlapping. So these yeah. conjunctive feature locations lead to something that can be read out nicely if if they if if all of their features are changing fast enough. Yeah. Interesting. So so the, it's it's like our intuition was right in lots of ways, but at least it I got I got a lot of nuances here. And I learned learned that it, in my mind, is less of a fatal flaw in their model than I thought before. Uh, uh, though, though, as you point out, the the learning question it, it's still it still feel like a pretty big problem to me. Yeah. But, um, again, I won't call it fatal. I'll just yeah, I overstated it, that. Yeah, I'll just say like, well, it's pretty hard for me to understand how it's going to work, but um, I'll think about it. You know, there's other ways to skin this problem. I mean, 
well, I, I mean, we're mixing up a bunch of things. You know, one fundamental problem we've been trying to deal with is like, well, if I don't have multiple modules at different, you know, to work with, how do I get my unique representations? How do I do all these things? How do I get all the benefits? And of course, I've been proposing that, and, and we and you've been talking about too, Marcus, that you know we can get we can do this because there's really a bunch of one D modules that we're not we're not seeing. They're not people aren't in the heart of the city, but they're there. And if the one D modules give you all the benefits we want, and then somehow this two D representation in the grid cells is it's just a projection of the one D modules, and it, it it serves a different purpose. Um, and so you can't read out the grid cells and, and know where you are, uh, or at least not uniquely so. Um, but I'm, I'm pointing out this, there's other issues of getting, I'm not sure why they went to this multi-module approach that they did in, in the Barron's paper, but um, there's other ways to achieve similar results um, without having these issues. So I, I think we'll have to leave it as unknown at the moment. And um, I do appreciate that Tim gave you some feedback on the presentation. We like what you did last week, that's good. Um, okay, I think we'll have to leave this as sort of unsettled uh, at the moment.